Now, what I'm going to do this morning, I don't know if I've ever done this for Easter, but we're going to be reading a lot of passages, kind of going through the story. So if you want to put your fingers in your Bible, I'll tell you where I'm going to be reading, but it'll be moving along. I am going to uh, try to do my best to tell you where we're at. I'm going to start with a couple of passages, but if you keep your finger in Luke 23 and 4, if you want to wait one place, in Mark chapter 16, maybe 15 at times, uh, and in the Gospel of John chapter 20, and and that's good. So between those, Matthew, Mark, Luke, I guess I skipped Luke 23, uh, we'll be going back and forth in those. But first I want to, we've been going through the book of Romans here, and so I thought I'd just choose one passage from Romans. And I just heard the kids say, are we done yet after that song? <laughs> are we done yet? Uh, well, this is actually just the beginning, you know. The resurrection is where it all started. So uh, I was in a nursing home and, and sometimes the people ask questions right in the middle when you're speaking and preaching. And I like it if they have an honest question. So I try to answer it. And then at the end, I'm excited if somebody still has more questions. And I remember asking at the end of a service, anybody have any more questions? The lady's hand went up way in the back and, and uh, I said, yes. And I was so elated that she had a question. Said, are we done yet? <laughs> I said, I guess, I guess we are. Uh, but no, this is just the beginning. But uh, Romans chapter 4, you don't have to look that one up. Romans 4.25 says, he, who was, he was delivered up because of our transgressions, your sins and my sins, our offenses. Why was Jesus put to death? The Bible tells us it was because of our offenses. And he was raised from the dead for our justification. It was in one of the songs we sang. Justification is where God says, I declare you not guilty. I declare you uh, just in my sight. And so what a thing, again, without the resurrection, that couldn't happen. But aren't you glad that Matthew didn't end with the 27th chapter? <laughs> that Mark's gospel did not end in chapter 15. Luke did not end in chapter 23. And John did not end in chapter 19. Each of them have one more chapter to tell about the resurrection. And John has two more after about the resurrection of Christ. It would have been a sad day, wouldn't it, if we just had that in our Bibles, that Jesus died? He'd be no different than Muhammad or Buddha, who are still dead to this day. And yet Jesus came alive. And so each of these gospel added it. Uh, uh, another chapter is added to it. And uh, for this fact, it, it really changes everything. But today I wanted to <clears throat> focus. I, I was just impressed with Mary Magdalene this year as I was reading the, the story of the resurrection. So I'm going to focus a little bit on her life and her witness of, of the resurrection and of, of Jesus's life. But just to give you a little, she was called Mary Magdalene, uh, a town from Mag Magdala called Mag on the western shore of Galilee. And so it was, there were so many, if you read the count here, you'll know that there's so many Marys in the Bible, right? It's kind of like in Spanish, the Jose. Jose, there's plenty of them. And the, in, in the Reto program in Spain, in the drug rehab, in order to identify some of these different Jose, they say Jose from Barcelona, or this Jose from Valladolid. Or, you know, they'll say some where they're from, so you can differentiate which Jose are you talking about. Same way with Mary, as, the, as you go through the gospel, Jesus' mother was named Mary. There's Mary Magdalene. There's Mary, the mother of Joseph, and, and so on. And so you have all these Marys, and to keep it straight, you'll find out that in, as we read this account, they're going to talk about the different Mary. But I wanted to focus on Mary Magdalene and her story. And uh, I'm going to begin in Luke chapter 8 and verses 1 through 3, just to give you the beginning of, of her meeting with Christ. It says, It came to pass afterwards that he was went through every city and village that his Jesus did, preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward, and Susanna, and many others who provided for him from their substance. I love this picture. As you think about the life of Mary Magdalene, she was possessed by demons. I mean, I don't know what her life was like in the past, but I know she was hurting. <laughs> and uh, demons had actually possessed her. And Jesus comes along and he sets her free. And what does she begin to do? Being set free from her sin and the slavery of sin and, and the, the powers of darkness, she now 
loves this one who set her free and begins to follow him wherever he goes. And she had, she had, from her substance, from her money, from her possessions, she used that to minister to Christ, to feed him. And if you'll notice in the gospel, you don't pick it up too much, but you find out that it wasn't just the 12 disciples that followed Jesus everywhere. Somebody had to feed them. Somebody had to take care of their needs. And you find that Mary Magdalene, and she wasn't the only one. And Susanna was here and uh, others were here. Uh, Joanna, they, from their substance, they took it and they gave it to Jesus, provided a meal for it. Uh, provided other things, maybe he needed a cloak or something to wear. But these people took care of his needs. It's a beautiful picture, isn't it? Here was a girl, demon possessed. Think of the the wildest person you can, or the thing you, the person you think farthest from Christ right now, or the beggar on the street, the alcoholic. That Jesus Christ can set them free, and they can be uh, followers of Jesus Christ. And Mary definitely was became a follower of Jesus Christ, Mary Magdalene, and she gave to him from her substance, and. Uh, and served him in that way. And I'm going to jump to Matthew, or Mark's gospel, the 15th chapter, and start at verse 41. Uh, I'm, or I'm sorry, John 19:25. So if you don't want to follow, it might just be easier. <laughs> You're welcome to, and if you want the verses, I can give them to you later. But I'm going to start with just a, a verse or two out of, uh, the, the, just showing the fact that Mary, Mary witnessed a lot of things. After she was converted, she came to Christ, but she witnessed uh, the crucifixion. She was there. She got a close, close up view <laughs> of what was going on in those days. The one she loved and the one who set her free. In John 19, 25, it says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister. Do you know Mary had a sister? Mary's sister was there by the cross and Mary, the wife of Clovis. See how many Marys there are? And Mary Magdalene. And there's more. But he says, these were by the cross. And what a sight that was, huh? Can you imagine somebody you knew, somebody you loved, somebody who set you free from sin and seeing their body mangled, bleeding on that cross and then getting a close-up view of that. And there's Mary, who remember before she had Jesus or, the, or after it was said of her that a, Mary, a sword was going to pierce your side. This is it. She's at the cross. They were probably in her wild. I mean, she's the mother. Think of your child hanging before you on a cross. And there we find by the cross, Mary Magdalene. I, where are the other disciples? John's there. But she wouldn't hear a peep about any of the rest of them. And we'll go on. So there, Mary is a witness to the crucifixion. She saw it with her own eyes and was in pain because of it and was shedding tears. We'll find that out later, too. Mark chapter 15, verse 40 and 41. There were also women looking on from afar. Now they're looking on from afar. Among them who were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and the less, and Joseph, Salome, and all, uh, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Quite an entourage that came with Jesus when he came. Well, I suppose they came on the day when on uh, Palm Sunday, right? A lot of those women, they still ministered to him. It talks about many of these women who came. And now it says that they were standing afar. And I just want to read something I uh, read in a book. It said some of these women had earlier been at the foot of the cross in John that I just read. But then unable to watch Jesus suffering at such close range, they were looking on from afar. Their sympathetic loyalty was a sharp contrast to the disciples who, except for John, were nowhere to be found. Hmm. Nowhere to be found. And then she not only witnessed his crucifixion, she witnessed his death. In Luke chapter 23 and verse 46, it says this. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. And when the centurion, the soldier there, when the centurion saw what had happened, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. And the whole crowd who came together to that site. Oh, wait a minute. I'm sorry. Am I in the right place? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Certainly this was the righteous man. Maybe came together to the site. 
seeing that what had been done, beat their breasts and returned. Before this, just before this, I meant to read, read this at the beginning of this part section here. It talked about how the heavens rent, uh, the, that the, the temple and the curtain was ripped from top to bottom, making access for us into the very presence of God. Now we don't need that curtain. And it's significant that it was ripped from top to bottom. It was ripping from above. God ripped it open. And then from 12 o'clock, we read that from 12 o'clock in the afternoon till 3 in the afternoon, there was darkness over the land. That's not normal. <laughs> and to have darkness there. And the people witnessed it. And then Jesus cries out and, and his last cry. And he yields his spirit. And breathes his last, it said. Um, and they, these, these people were there. And it says, uh, I continue from there, that, that centurion said, surely this was a righteous man in the whole crowd. They beat their breasts and returned. And all his acquaintances and the women who followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. They saw it. They heard the centurion cry. and say, this, this was a righteous man. And they were there to witness his death. So they witnessed him on the cross close up. They witnessed his death, his physical death. But now they're going to witness also his burial. And I'm going to read in Mark, er, Mark chapter 15. Excuse me, I'm going to look this one up. And starting at verse 42 to 40, through 47. Now when evening had come, uh, because it was a preparation day, that is the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent uh, council member, remember that? He was a council member, uh, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he had been already dead, had summoned the centurion, and he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph, then brought uh, the fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen and he laid him in the tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb and Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid they didn't quit falling there was no time Mary seemed to be she wanted to be wherever he was whatever was happening so she witnessed his crucifixion she witnessed his death and now actually the place where they actually laid his body. <clears throat> and then she witnessed the resurrection. You know, the amazing thing is how many times did Jesus say before he was going to go to the tomb that he would rise on the third day? And yet no one, not one person, expected him to rise after the crucifixion. Not one. I, it's an amazing thing. And I, of course, you're not used to seeing that every day somebody rise from the dead. But they didn't, nobody anticipated it. Some lost hope. They said, oh, we were hoping this had been the one who would redeem Israel. They were hoping their hopes were dashed and people were confused. You ever been there in your spiritual walk with Christ? You ever been confused? The disciples sure were. Everybody seemed to be here. They're confused. They're wondering what's going on. Nobody expected it, uh, especially after Roman, Roman crucifixion where he was so disfigured, you know. Come to life again, how? So on. In Mark 16, 1, it goes on. In verse 1, it says, Now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices that they might come and anoint him. The Sabbath was passed. They were coming. They were going to go back to that grave that they saw Joseph of Arimathea, put him in that grave and anoint his body for burial. It had been started the process. It was interrupted by the Sabbath. And they come back early first thing with these spices to anoint the Lord's body. And so you see there wasn't really an anticipation that he would rise. And in Matthew 28, verse 1, it says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, this is what happened, guys. This is what happened. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. What a scene, an earthquake, as a, as a heaven, an angel descends from heaven with a job to do. 
His job was to roll the stone away. And then he sat upon it. And uh, this all happened before the women got to. They're on their way. They're, they're on their way with their spices. And as they go, they probably felt the earthquake, but didn't know what was happening. And Matthew doesn't put much, uh, any break between chapter or verse uh, 4 and 5. But there is a break. If you read the, all the accounts, there's got to be a break there of things that happened. And so the angel comes and rolls away the stone. One thing you'll see in this story, and one thing you ought to know about the stone being rolled away, it wasn't, kids, listen to this, the, the stone wasn't rolled away so that Jesus could come out. <laughs> the stone was rolled away so that we could look in. So we could see that Jesus is not dead. Because see, Jesus, he can, come, he can come out of that grave with a stone there, rolled in front of the tomb. He, remember later on, he comes into the house, the door's being locked, and Jesus is just there. He comes through. <laughs> And so this, this stone being rolled away was not for Jesus to come out, but it was for us to look in and see that he's not there anymore. And so this angel, once he did that, he sits on the stone. And the guards shook with fear. Remember, that they said, hey, this imposter said when he was here, this deceiver named Jesus. It's funny that how the soldiers understood that Jesus said he would rise from the dead, and yet his disciples couldn't remember that. The, the, the soldier said, listen, this imposter said that he was going to rise from the third day. Uh, let's put a guard there because I, the disciples might try to steal his body. And then the, the rumor about his resurrection or whatever is going to be worse than the first deception he caused. And so Pilate says, all right, take your guard, make it secure, make it secure. And so that's why these soldiers are here. They're guarding this tomb. But the angel comes down. They witness it shining like lightning, <laughs> scared the wits out. You know what? They were so scared. They were scared stiff. Look at this, what happened uh, in verse four, I think, um, if I can find my place. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. I take it then they just dropped. <laughs> Quite a sight. Hey, the spiritual world is real, people. I don't know if you get numb to these things, but if an angel appeared right now, just an angel, not even Jesus in all of his glory. Things would happen in this room that we would be shaking in our boots or shoes, whatever you got on. We'd be shaken. We're not used to seeing this, but heavenly realm came here and these guys fell like dead men. Sometimes, I don't know how long they were out, but the women are on their way. By the time the women came, the soldiers aren't there anymore. These guys come to and, and they run back into town. They see the grave empty and man, they're, they're hightailing it for town. And after they're gone and out of the way, the angel doesn't sit on the stone anymore. You find out that he, the angels got out. They went into the tomb and they're in the tomb. And now these women are coming to the grave. So the scene is being set uh, for what happens next. And then in Matthew's gospel, 28, verse 11 says this. Now, while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city. And here's what they did. They reported to the chief priests and all of, of all the things that had happened. These chief priests are probably saying, oh, no, my, what? what's going on? Uh, when they had assembled with the soldiers and consulted together, they gave them a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, tell them his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were sleeping, while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. See, for dereliction of duty, it could cost them their life. And so he said, listen, we'll, we'll take care of it. We'll, we'll appease the governor if it comes to his ears, all right? You guys are being quit, but they gave him a large sum of money to tell a lie. How many of you would, for a large money, money to tell a lie? Hmm. These guys witnessed it. I don't know how they could live with themselves, but maybe they could. So they took the large sum of money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Jews is, in Jesus' day, when this was written, there were still a lot of rumors going on. Ah, the disciples stole his body. Well, listen here. If the disciples stole his body, they, the rumor was this, that while we were sleeping, the disciples came and stole his body. Okay, you've got a group of soldiers there. They're sleeping. The disciples stole the body. How do you know if you're sleeping? Right? Hey, kids, how many times do you know your mom and dad walk into your room at night? You might, just to check on you and see if you're sleeping, and you are really sleeping, you don't remember that. So if you're asleep, how can you know it was the disciples who stole the body? If it was the disciples who did steal the body, why would you leave the grave clothes? Why would you take the time? Wouldn't you just grab him like he is with the grave clothes on if you're hightailing it out of there? 
He said, why is the grave clothes still there? A lot of questions to be answered. And if this was really true, and if they really wanted, they could have, all they needed to do was pr produce the dead body of Jesus. That's all they needed to do to set this rumor straight. But they never did. They never could find a dead body and present it the truth. So this was a lie. And why, again, then would the disciples die for a lie? Because all, almost all but John died a martyr's death because of the resurrection. They attested that Jesus rose from the dead. So this was their concocted story. In John 20, we pick up the story with Mary again. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple, whom Jesus loved. So John, that's John, Peter and John. And she said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went and the other disciple and they were going to the tomb. So they both ran. Mary ran. Now John and Peter begin to run. There's a lot of running going on here finding out the news here. They ran together and the other disciple outran Peter. Well, here's a race. Peter started out running and John says, oh, I'm not without me. And John goes running and he passes Peter and leaves Peter in the dust. And they just keep running to that grave and they get there and John's the first one. He came to the tomb first, John did. And he stooped down and looked in. Hey, that's why it's not there, the stone. And saw the linen cloths lying there. Yet he did not go in. He didn't go in. He's the first one there. He looked inside, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. And the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also. John's curiosity got the best. He, he finally went in with Peter and they looked around and they see this empty shroud. I mean, not unwrapped, but just the body had disappeared in there. So it's kind of just sunken down right there. Jesus just came right out of it and left, left the linen cloths there. And they're looking, they're staring at this, but not seeing a body anymore, just the grave clothes. And this is what it says. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also and he saw... And believed. This is the first time somebody actually believed something happened here. John believed. And he's the writer of this gospel. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. And the disciples went away and came to their own homes. Now if you write the other stories you'll find out and you think it's a contradiction that Mary was with a lot of women. And then they saw the angels inside the tomb. And they talked to them and said he's not here. He's risen. What are you doing looking for the dead among the living among the dead. You're looking in the wrong place. But what I think happened is that Mary was ahead of the others. Mary Magdalene, she did have her spice. She was coming with the other women, but she probably went on ahead. And she, when she saw the stone rolled away and looked in and saw that the body wasn't there anymore, she panicked and she fled. She ran back to tell John and Peter what had happened. And then these other women come a little bit later and look inside and see the angels. She didn't see the angels. She didn't go inside. The and so she runs back to report to them what happens. And she said, they have taken him. And I don't know where they put him. That was her report. And then Matthew, or Luke 24, verses 10 to 12 say, it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with him, who told these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, just stories, just, just myths, it seemed to them. And they did not believe them. Mary Magdalene, can you, can you say that one more time? Ah, I don't believe you. They did not believe him. And Peter arose and ran to the tomb and stooped down and saw him. The clothes lying them by themselves and departed, marveling to himself what had happened. My goodness, there's marvel going, what, what happened? John 20 will pick up the story again. Now Mary probably, Mary Magdalene probably felt, followed John, probably couldn't run as fast as Peter and John. So she comes in a little behind and she comes back to the tomb. 
This is their second trip. You see, when you read the accounts, you find out there's a lot of going back and forth, going to the disciples, going back to the grave, going back to the disciples, going back to the grave. And now she's on her back behind Peter and John. And she comes to the tomb. And she's, she's in tears. She's in tears. And John 20, verse 11. But Mary stood outside by the tomb, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb. Again, the stone was rolled away so that she could look in. Not so Jesus could get out. And she saw two angels in white, sitting one at the head, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord. This struck me as I was reading it. She said, They have taken away my Lord. Is he your Lord? Is he precious to you? Does he mean anything to you? She is in tears. And she said, they've taken away my Lord. He belongs to me. He set me free. I'm confused. He said, I don't know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. And did not know that it was Jesus. Boy, Jesus kept doing this to people. He let them see him, but he wouldn't. He held. They couldn't understand who he was at first. Almost every encounter was like that first. Jesus said to her. The angel said, Women, woman, why are you weeping? Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you had, didn't even answer the question this time. Disciples, like, why are you they taking away my Lord? So the gardener, what she thinks is the gardener says, hey, uh, why are you weeping? Who are you seeking? She says, sir, if you've carried him away, tell me where you've laid him and I will take him away. She just wanted to be with him. The matter was conditional. And Jesus said to her, Mary. Imagine that moment. Her eyes must have lit up. Huh? She recognized that voice when he called her name. Isn't that what the Bible says? My sheep, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. And she, it must have been the thrill of her life to hear her name called that morning. Mary. And her eyes must open. Wow. Turned around. Recognized it was the voice of Jesus, the risen Lord. And she turned around and said to him, Rabboni, which means teacher, uh, greatest of all teachers. Jesus said, to her, or, uh, Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not a, a yet ascended to my father, but go to my brethren. Mary, I got a job for you. Said, go to my brethren. What a word. I don't know if this is the first time Jesus called the disciples, but I think it might be the first time he called them brothers. He called them friends. He called them different things, but here he says, tell my brethren, tell my brothers and sisters. Do you, does that put a thrill within you that Jesus is, is my brother? Go tell my brethren. And say to them, I am ascending to my father and to your father. I am ascending to my God. I am ascending to your God. I just got a thrill out of it reading this time, realizing, boy, he's he's my God. He's ascending to my God. He's ascending to my Lord. And he's calling me brethren. And that was the message she had. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord. Last time she came, she said, Peter, John, I, I went to the grave. I the grave was empty. I don't know. They took Jesus. I don't know where they laid him. Now she's coming back for the second time. She finds Peter. I saw him. I've seen him. He's alive. The thrill of that moment for her especially was something else. That she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. You know, she was the first herald to go out and preach and to be able to say this good news, the greatest news ever. He's risen from the dead. And she was got to be the first one to really go out and proclaim it. I saw Jesus. He's alive. 
And in Mark 16, it says now when, uh, in verse 9, Now when he rose early the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene. Isn't that sweet? I think there's benefits to the Christians who will stick close to Jesus. I think there's benefits to coming to gather with God's people. My dad would say this when he saw a revival when he was a 12-year-old boy. He said, we couldn't wait to go to church that day because we didn't know who was going to get saved. Apparently, it was a a regular occurrence. And they didn't want to miss anything. He was a 12-year-old kid. He said, I I couldn't miss it. And if you didn't go, you wouldn't know what God was doing that day. Look at who messed out later. We'll find out Thomas. (laughs) He wasn't there and missed out big time, didn't he? All right. I forgot where I am. Okay. He first appeared to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast out seven demons. He adds that thought right there. The first to appear to him, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She had been set free. She followed him, and she got to be the first to see this resurrected Lord. What a thought. What a, there's a benefit to that. And she went and told that she had seen him, and they more as they mourned and wept. So apparently, John or Mark adds this to it: that when Mary came back the second time to tell them, "Hey, I saw him; he's alive," that the disciples, what were they doing? They were weeping as they mourned and wept. And when they heard this, that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. Oh, that's just Mary. You know her past. Do we do this as Christians too? Well, we kind of know their past. They, in their past, they were liars. You know, and probably still telling the stories. You know? but they, whatever the reason, they didn't believe. And then to, to make matters worse, and after that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went in the country. That's those on the way to Emmaus, I believe. And they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later he appeared to the eleven as they were at the table in the evening. It was. And he rebuked their unbelief and their hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had been sent after he had been risen. God takes a little time. He meets the disciples. The first thing he says to them we see is, is peace be to you. And boy, they needed to hear that. <laughs> there are times in our life where we have to hear God say to us, peace. Peace. Because boy... After you deny him like Peter, those are comforting words. And Jesus comes in their midst, but one of the first thing he does while he's sitting at the table anyway, eating them, is give him a little rebuke. Why didn't you believe the women? I, I said to you women, you didn't believe him. How many times does God send a message to us that we don't believe it? And God has to reprove us and rebuke us for it. And so now he's sitting at the table, the disciples leave rebuking him. Why? Why didn't you believe? I sent people to you. You did not believe them. Luke chapter 24 and verse 21. This is the two that were on their way to Emmaus. And Jesus asked them, why are you so sad? And you go, they're leaving the group. They had been with the 12 apparently. And they leave. This is their report. But as they were, we were hoping that it had been he who was going to redeem Israel. We had our hope that this was the one we were looking for. But he's dead. And here they go on with the story. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. And they're more bummed than ever. Yes, and certain women of our our company, notice that, certain women of our company, who arrived at the tomb early, astonished us. Woo, we were astonished. And they're telling Jesus this. And when they did not find the body, They came saying that he had also seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. And certain of those who were with us, Peter and John, went to the tomb and found it just as the women said. They knew a lot. But him they did not see. They got no further and Jesus rebukes them. He says, oh, foolish ones and slow to believe Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into glory? 
And beginning with Moses and the prophets, he expounded them all the scriptures, things concerning himself. He just opened up their minds. This is all about Christ. When you read the Old Testament, the prophets, it's all about Christ. It points to him. Jesus began to do it. They begged him to stay. He stays. He eats lunch with them. He pretends he's going to go forward. They, They begged him to stay. You ever do that with Jesus? Lord, stay. I'm enjoying this so much. Stay with me. Abide with me. And they did, and their eye, they were, while they were breaking bread together and eating a meal together, their eyes were open. They saw it was Jesus, and boom, he disappeared. They hightail it back to Jerusalem to tell the disciples. The disciples, as they get there, they tell the disciples they don't believe him. And then Jesus comes in, and it's kind of the order of things that happened there. But again, Thomas was missing. <laughs> Thomas was missing. He wasn't there, he didn't get to see with. With the other disciples that, that Jesus was risen from the dead. And so they tell Thomas in, in John 20, 24. Now Thomas called the twin. Has no bearing whatsoever, okay? Twin, all right? That's not a bad thing. Just letting you know that. Thomas the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. These guys walked with Jesus and now all his buddies are saying, James, Peter, we've seen the Lord. And I I don't believe it. I, 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 seeing is believing, right? Verse 26, after eight days, he was way behind the times. The next Sunday comes along and says the disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. And Jesus came, the doors being locked shut. He stood in their midst and said, peace to you. And when he said, then he said to Thomas, reach your finger in here. Look at my hands and reach into your hand in here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. First thing that no, no real rebuke to him and. You know, he, he, Jesus wants us to believe and he holds out his hand to Peter. Look, look, you want a nail head? I'm giving what you're asking for. Here I am. It's me. Touch me. Feel me. And in, in the gospel, I say, we've, we've handled what our, we're telling you things that we've handled with our hands, these realities. And don't be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said, my Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Did you know today you're more blessed than Thomas was? Do you ever say to God, God, just I'd be more assured if you just show yourself to me. If you just do something that would confirm to me that you're Jesus said, blessed, you're more blessed. If you don't see and yet you believe. There's a special blessing that comes along with that. Lord, I believe you anyway. Boy, Abraham sure did, didn't he? So we're blessed today. If you believe in Christ, not seen. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, in the book of John. But these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in his name. And not just believing the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. That's included in it. But man, when you're changed, it transforms you. It changes you. And it gives you life. You go from, uh, Terry read today, from death to life spiritually. And in Germany, when I was talking at the funeral service, I just mentioned that verse too. He who has the Son of God has life. If you have Jesus, if you possess him, he possesses you, should I say. You have life. You have spiritual life. You have eternal life. He who does not have the Son of God, if you're here today without the Son of God, without Jesus, you have no life. Physical life, yes. Spiritual, eternal life, no. And you die in that state, you're damned. But that's why Jesus came. To set us free. And so, He came. The purpose was that you might believe and what? Have life in His name. You have life today. You have eternal life. And John first 35 says this. And and he who was seen has testified, is talking about himself, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling you the truth. 
And so say, I know I'm telling you the truth so that you may believe. Is Jesus perhaps rebuking any of us here this morning? Is God rebuking some of us for our unbelief and slowness of heart to believe the things he's written here? We are slow to believe. Somebody asked me after a wrestling practice this week, a 25-year-old guy, he says, now, Dan, do you really believe everything in the Bible or just parts of it? I said, man, the whole thing, the whole thing. Well, I said, if we, if I could pick and choose parts and how do you know if it's real or not? It's all either all real or all a lie. <laughs> and it's all real. And so it is truth as it's written that we might believe. I'm almost done here. First Corinthians 15 verse 3. For I delivered to you, first of all, Paul is writing to the Corinthians. First of all, that which I have received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Died for us and never forget that. Let that become precious to you. That he was buried... That he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And that he was seen by Cephas. Peter saw him. And then by the twelve. And that he was seen with by over 500 brethren at once. Of whom the greater part remain to the present. But some have fallen asleep. He said, well, at the time Paul was writing the Corinthians, he said, listen, Jesus appeared to this one, to this one. And the biggest one he did was 500 people at one time. How can you deceive that many people? It wasn't real. He said, he appeared to 500 people at one time. He says, most of them are still alive today. Some have died, but most of them are still alive. Ask so-and-so. Ask Peter. Ask John. Ask this guy. Ask that gal. Ask Mary Magdalene. They saw it. They witnessed it. And after that, he was seen by James and by all the apostles. Then last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. On the road to Damascus, the Apostle Paul had an encounter with Jesus, the risen Jesus of the Bible, and he saw Jesus, and it transformed his life. He was never the same again. And when you meet Jesus, you'll never be the same again. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, and I'm saying along with Paul, then then my profession is the worst profession in the world. I'm, I'm a false witness. If I'm telling you he rose when he didn't, then my preaching is for nothing. Not only my preaching for nothing, then your faith is vain and futile. And he says this, and worst of all, you're still in your sins. And then the last thing he says is, and then, and, and those, let's see here, he says, and those who have died have perished. My goodness, it's bad enough to die in our sins. I'm still in my sins. And then if I die in my sins, he says, I'm damned. If Christ didn't rise from the dead. You see how important the resurrection is? He rose for our justification to declare us righteous. And that's why that is so important. If only in this life, Paul says, we have hope in Christ, we are all to be pitied of all people. Man, we're a sad bunch. If you didn't believe Jesus rose from the dead and we're getting together every Sunday like this, we're a sad bunch. And if your only hope is for this life and after that there's nothing left, my goodness. The whole thing's just a shot of sham. <laughs> and we're to be pitied above everybody else for believing such a thing. But if he is risen, then he has. My preaching's not in vain. Your faith is not in vain. Christ is risen from the dead. And I'm not in my sins anymore. And when I die, I will not go to hell. I'll go to heaven. Not because of who I am or what I've done, but because of the cross of Jesus Christ, his burial and resurrection for my sin, for me and for you. So how has the resurrection affected you? (laughs) How has it affected your life? If there's no change, then you're still lost. St. Corinthians 5.15 says this, He died for all, that those who live should live no longer for themselves. How many of you young people Or kids or adults are living for yourself. He said he died not so that we can live for ourselves anymore, but that we should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. That's what life's all about. It doesn't mean you'll be a preacher. Maybe you'll be something else in your life. But uh, you're living it for God. You go to work Monday morning for God. 
You go to work Tuesday and every day of the week and every everything you do is for God. I, I hope I can say this because it's not stressed enough. People live for themselves. And it's, it comes into the church too. People think, well, what are your plans? Well, I just, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And we're taught to pray our you know, Father in heaven, your will be done on earth. Don't you want to be involved in God's will? There's, there's nothing greater than the will of God. So live for the one who died for you. It makes sense, right? Len Raven, he'll always ask that question. All the bottom of all his letters that, that we got from, too, always had that. Are the things that you're living for worth Christ dying for? It makes you think. And so who did that? Mary Magdalene, didn't she? She lived for the one who died for her and rose again. And there's salvation, let me say this in closing, there's salvation in none other but Jesus Christ. That's what it says in the book of, uh, of Acts chapter 4. When Peter and John were giving witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ and it said they did it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And when they did it, people got under conviction of sin. They blamed the people. Did you know they blamed the people? You crucified him. And we today have kind of taken the blame. Yeah, the Jews and Pilate did it. You know what? You did it. I did it. I had a part in it. I was an accomplice. Because it was my sin that was placed upon him and your sin that was placed upon him too. So you had a part in his death. We squirm from that. We don't like that. But we had a part in crucifying him. And Peter blames and says, you crucified him. But God raised him from the dead. And some of those people were transformed right after it said that 5,000 men believed. He's alive. And he's still setting people free. Amen. Aren't you glad? Is he still setting people free? From sin? From demon possession? From all these things like Mary Magdalene? He's still setting people free today. Like even a thief on the cross. Even in his hour of agony when you would think he doesn't want to do any. I mean every breath probably was hard to get air. And yet he did it in reaching out to the criminal next to him on the cross. And saying, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Saving people, transforming their lives. And he's still in that business. And, Jesus, and John says this, that Jesus said, because I live, you're going to live also. Isn't that good news? I mean, now I begin to live too, but I'm going to live forever and ever with Jesus. When this body gives or he comes back. And you know what? This is no April Fool's joke here today. We're not fooling around here with that. It's it's Jesus, the resurrection. And this is a story. And God is continuing to transform lives. And just like Mary Magdalene, in a sense, God transformed my life. And now I want to use every day. I don't have much time left. I'm getting older. Just had a birthday not too long ago. And that tells me I'm getting older. My time is short. It's getting shorter every day. Is I want to live for I want to use my substance, my money, my possessions to minister to Christ, to put into his work, invest in eternal things. And I, don't, I mean, it's a privilege. I, like Bruce says, I don't have to. I get to. Right. I get to serve God. I get to invest in eternal things and be a part of that kingdom. I want to. Be, don't you like Mary Magdalene? Want to be close to Jesus? She got to see a glimpse of him first. Many of them didn't get to see quite that close up and have that one-on-one. -on -one. The other women too, they saw him, but they saw Jesus at one time. And they all knelt down, the women there, hugged his feet, grabbed, they worshipped him there. And Mary had a one-on-one -on -one with him. And Mary's still with him. Mary's still with him. Today as we're speaking, 2018, April 1st, Mary Magdalene is in heaven with the thief on the cross. With Chris Doddlin, who passed away this year in our church. Young guy who died of a heart attack. Together in heaven. Because Jesus said what? I'm not a God of the dead, but the God of the living. That's why he says, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Because why? They're still alive. They're not dead. They're alive today. And I better close because I'm just going to start rambling. Let's pray. Father in heaven. We thank you for the resurrection that raised up Jesus from the dead. Thank you that that same power dwells in us through the Holy Spirit and will one day transform this lowly body 
into one like yours. Oh, Jesus, help us like Mary Magdalene to go out and proclaim the best news ever, that there is a risen Savior, the God that we talk to and who intercedes for us on our behalf. And I don't know why, but Lord, I, I can picture as it were Jesus right now, lifting his nail-pierced hands, interceding on our behalf. And you still see those nail-pierced hands and feet crying out on our behalf, interceding for us. Oh, Lord, when you say you loved us and you had a great love towards us, you weren't lying. You loved us to the utmost. No friend has ever died for us like you did. I know my mom and dad loved me, but they couldn't love me like you do. You loved me when you died, when I was a sinner. You saved me, made me a child of God, allowing me to come when I die into your presence. But even on the way now, proving your love, your nail-pierced hands still intercede on my behalf. You're the only mediator between God and man. And I thank you that you have nail pierced hands to plead on our behalf. If God did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all thanks? Oh God, and I ask you to meet every need of every heart here this morning. Do your work within each heart. And I pray this week would be a blessed week. A week that would be walking with the transformed Jesus. Lord, if there's anybody who doesn't know you, let, let them be awed by your presence and transformed by the risen Savior today. And then help us, Lord, to continue to walk with you. Forgive us, Lord. I ask for forgiveness for myself, for us as a church, and for others for being slow to believe the scriptures at times. Oh, Lord, forgive us. Open our understanding to the scriptures, even this week in our personal time with you. Oh God, do a great work in our hearts. Teach us your ways. Continue to reveal yourself to us. And thank you that you care for each child here, each baby, and to the oldest adult, Lord. If you gave us life, there's purpose in life. I ask that you fulfill it in each of our hearts this week. And Lord, we give you the glory. And thank you that we serve a risen Savior. In the mighty name of the of Jesus, we ask this thing, and for his glory, Lord. Amen. Amen.